I think we talked about just the definitions of life, death, resurrection. We talked about some fun stuff like death. But now we're going to talk about the good stuff, the resurrection. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at uh, six themes, kind of a thematic approach. And how does the Old Testament teach and present the idea of a resurrection? And the idea of most of these passages, they are coming from a, a dark time, a dark period. So think in your lifetime, when was a dark period in your life? When was, gosh, you didn't think you were going to make it. And that's kind of the idea. So we're going to look at resurrection hope. So what was the problem in the Old Testament? Starting down here in your notes. The problem is the Old Testament faced death just like we did. So what is the solution to death? A physical, bodily resurrection. So the same problems that faced us faced Old Testament uh, saints and people. And the same need. We need a physical, bodily resurrection. And we looked at Isaiah 25, 8 last week where it talks about death being swallowed up. God would be victorious over, over death. If you look up here, um, in Genesis 3.22, Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden. And I brought up a point of the tree of life. The tree of life wasn't necessarily destroyed. The problem was with the exile, which is an important concept we'll look at in a little bit of exile. They are exiled from the Garden of Eden. They are prohibited from partaking in that tree of life. The implication there is possibility that the tree of life was there so that Adam and Eve and as well as all humanity would experience embodied immortality. Because they weren't denied necessarily the tree of life, but they are prohibited for a, for a time from taking of that. And we really don't see the tree of life until Revelation 22. I think there's some implications throughout the scripture, but we really don't see it there. So God is going somewhere. He's going from here to here. How does he get there? To a bodily resurrection. Now the tree of life here isn't for sin because sin's already been dealt with. It probably symbolizes uh, unending life, enjoyment, uh, a symbol of complete spiritual and physical healing. So God is going from exile, prohibition, to partaking of the tree of life. How does he get there? Resurrection hope. So we're going to be looking at this. And I asked the question earlier, um, what, what was a dark period in your life when you didn't think you were going to make it? And you experienced hope. Anybody want to share? Hope. The closest thing I can come to it was a few years back, I had COVID. I ended up in ICU. And the warning there is, listen to your wife. Because I was sick. It's like, oh, I just didn't have energy. So, no, you're going in. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Well, finally, it's like, no, you're going in. I had advice to you for a few days. No. The regular, regular room. Never once did I not think I wasn't coming out. I just had that hope. I had that expectation. Even Jill, who was by herself, she never lost this that I was coming out. 
it's that hope that somehow we made it. Anybody else have a similar experience where it's like, Egh! and then you got that hope? You want to share? Well, I am so glad that everyone is so blessed in their life. <laughs> I think the hope is underlining everything. Yes. You, it never goes away. Yes. Um, you know, I've been through divorce. I've been through sexual abuse. I've been through um, just a lot of different things. But it was never to the point where I had no hope. Right. I think without hope, we just can't. We've got to have that hope. You know, it's got to move us forward. Anybody else? I don't know the exact saying, but I've heard a lot of times like, you know, people are willing to fight for anything as long as there's hope. Yes. As soon as the hope's gone. So, you see people in wars and um, different rights and <clears throat> or different um, things that they fight for. Or, you know, but once that hope's gone, it, it, it's over. Yeah. Exactly. I think, I remember, I shifted hope when I had tried general neuralgia. I, I really lost hope of physical being whole. Okay. My hope was that I would step into eternity. Okay. So I went from, you know, I can handle this, Lord heal me, to Lord please take me home. So my hope wasn't what it once was, which was physical wholeness. My hope was, I want to end this and uh, yeah. go to heaven. So I mean, I still had hope, it just shifted yeah, to the true. eternal platform. So. It's, it's that hope. So we look at some scenarios <coughs> where they were relatively dark times, these individuals. A quick language trivia, the phrase, by the skin of my teeth. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? Yeah. Is it a biblical oh. phrase? The answer is yes. Job 19. He talks about, I, I would have I barely made it by the skin of my teeth. That's found in Job 19. Let's look at Job 19. Verses 25 and 26. And if you know the story of Job, he lost everything. And then everybody he cared about came against him. His wife came against him. You know, you know, just, just curse God and die. Just get it over with. And then his friends come and give him counsel, if you will. Basically saying, Job, you screwed up. You're a master, you're a sinner. You know, God's doing this. And all through it, Job says, no, I'm innocent. I don't understand it, but I'm innocent. Chapter 19, Job almost agrees with one of his accusers. Basically, he's saying, if you're right, if I'm indeed a sinner, then God is justified, and I, I'm getting what I deserve. Because God's holy, I'm not. Therefore, I'm getting exactly what I deserve. And that's when he uses the phrase, I'll make it, but I'm going to make it by the skin of my teeth. But then, but then he says this, and a familiar phrase, again, I didn't realize it was in Job, uh, verse 25. In spite of everything that Job's going through, in spite of the accusations, in spite of the wonder, the doubt, the grief, what's going on in my life? He has something inside him that says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. So he has that hope. But sometimes we read the scriptures, if we don't read them careful enough, God throws something in there and says, bam, and you read it carefully, go, wait a minute, whoa, let's back up here a minute. The next phrase what version are you using? I'm reading the New King James Version. Okay. 
Then Job says, after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see, verse 27, see for myself, my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me, in my flesh. What is Job talking about? He's talking about a bodily resurrection, a physical change, even though his current situation has no hope. So for Job, I'm just going to put resurrection here, R, is the solution to evil. So Job's saying, in spite of the evil I'm experiencing, this loss and these, everyone coming against me, my own personal doubts, if there's a resurrection, it's going to solve this problem. These problems that Job's facing are going to be gone. So in Job 19, 25 to 26, there's hope. There's hope for the end of this. But we have hope. If, if the resurrection is the solution to evil, then we need a hero. We need a heroic figure that's going to solve this problem. We need a figure that, uh, that can understand life, death and can get us through that. In Psalms, we are, we are introduced to this figure, this Messiah, this anointed one. I don't think that's spelled the right button. Messiah. So we're introduced to this mystery figure, if you will. And in Psalm, the first key there, Psalms 91, 16, 21, 4, 23, 6, the key phrase is length of days or long life, which is a euphemism for eternal life. So if we talk about the Messiah, we know it's Jesus Christ. The Old Testament they knew, but they weren't sure who and what exactly was this figure. Psalms 91, that's one of the psalms that the devil quotes to Jesus. If you're the son of God, his, his angels will take charge of you and hold you up. So it's kind of got a messianic theme to it. But the idea of length of days is eternal life. Someone read Psalms 22, 21, and 22. And then someone read 29. Let's look at 21 to 22 first. And this is the psalm that Jesus quotes when he's on the cross. Someone got that? 22, verses 21 to 22. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name wait, to wait, my stop. brothers. Wait. In the congregation, I will praise you. Okay. If you read that psalms, David is saying, I just saw this anointed figure die horribly, crucified, dead, gone. Read, read 22 again. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. How does this anointed figure who's just been killed sing praises? Resurrection. So David's given us a hint that this Messiah, this figure, is going to rise again. He's going to live again. But take one step further, Psalms 29, or verse 29. Psalm 22, 29. <clears throat> All 
the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Okay. David's indicating that Messiah's resurrection is our resurrection. Not just David's, but everyone. So there's the imp implication that um, the Messiah's resurrection is also David's resurrection, also our resurrection. One more thing. This one this one's will get you. 1715. Got 1715. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. When I awake. Awake is a <clears throat> euphemism for death, resurrection. So David's saying, when I arise again, when I arise from the dead. So David had this hope, this belief of a resurrection, but he would behold the face of God. And I think some versions say, I, and I will be, be like him. That should get us going. Because just like Bob said, you know, sometimes our hope changes to, gosh, get me through this, to, I can't wait. Well, we actually behold God face to face in a physical, material, world and experience that and it's just you can't describe it I mean if you look at revelations kind of gives a description of heaven it doesn't do it justice it gives us some terms that we can understand like a temple and a city and streets and all that but it doesn't give us it doesn't match the glory and the experience we're going to have of seeing God face to face. And then we come to Hosea. Hosea, for the resurrection, the resurrection proves God's love. And the context, we talked about that a little bit last week, the context of Hosea, he, he prophesied and worked just prior to uh, the exile of Israel. Kind of gave some warnings, and then his life illustrated how much God loved him, loved Israel. Let's look at Hosea 11, 1 and 11. Again, another one of those things, if we read it carefully, we go, whoa, God's getting ready to do something. So, while we're looking that up, you have to understand we have a hard time understanding what it means to be exiled. But the only thing I can think of is if Canada came across Port Huron, took over Michigan, and then it said, you know what? You guys don't deserve to live in Michigan. We're taking you, they take everybody, separate families, whatever, and they don't just put us in like Toronto, a nice big city, they put us in the northern parts, and they sp spread. So not only can we not long, no longer go to our temple of worship in Ann Arbor, but we can't do anything. We cannot, we're separating from family, everything we know, we don't know if we're ever going to get back. And it's still hard to compre comprehend, even with that illustration. That's what these people are going through. They've been exiled, and they knew, at least a good number of them knew, the reason we're here is because we sinned, we went against God, and we started worshiping idols and all that. So they knew internally it's not right. But it still doesn't help the fact that they're separated from everything they knew and loved. Hebrew, or Hosea 11, 1 and 11. Who's got that? When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That was 1, and then you said 11? Yeah. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. 
and I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. Okay, he uses the term Egypt. That was a that was a big event in their time. That was considered an exile. So Hosea was using that term to represent an exile. They've been exiled. And he said, I will call my son out of Egypt. I will call them out of exile. They will come out of there trembling and nervous and scared. But and it's one of those things that's like, you got to kind of pause go, wait a minute. They're not just coming out of exile. They're going to be returned to. They're going to be living back in their homes, in their communities. God is going to restore them fully. Who else was called out of Egypt? Jesus. Prophetically. Jesus. 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 Out of Egypt, I called my son. So we have Israel. We have now Jesus coming out of Egypt in a, in a term, in a sense, of an exile. So it just kind of, kind of shows you how God's progressing to here. Let's look at Isaiah. Again, Isaiah was talking about a to a time of of the exile. So for Isaiah, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of low. It. Uh, Brings in, or is key? I should put it this way. Key to the new covenant. A, a restoration. And we looked at Isaiah 25 8, where it talks about swallowing up death, death will be destroyed. Let's look at Isaiah 26 19. I've got to go ahead and read it. Verse 19. Your dead shall live together with my body. They shall rise. So we're talking about a resurrection. God's using resurrection language to talk to them about coming out of exile. So we've got resurrection language. And then the rest of 19 talks about awake and sing. The term awake is a phrase or term that describes resurrection. So it's like awake. So now we've got this picture of morning, waking up in the morning. And I would say he's saying wake up and sing. It's going to be a rejoicing. Not like this morning when we woke up and realized there's more snow than should be. But it's like, oh, again. But it was a, a newness. You who dwell in dust. Dust is, again, a term for dead. Death. So they're, they've arised. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So there's two concepts here. We have morning, awake. We have do contrasted with death and dust. We have death, sleep. Now we're awake. We have dust, dryness. Now we have dew, moisture, and all that. These two things, morning and dew, is a refreshing thing. And it's one of those verses that we have to look back and go, whoa, wait a minute. Awakening, the morning, freshness, new. There's dew on the ground. It, it's good. God is using resurrection to make everything right. What was once dark now is bright. What was once dry and dead, God is making right to the resurrection. He's making all things new. Isaiah 53:10. Very familiar passage to most of us. It's talking about the suffering servant. And again, Isaiah knew, and probably a remnant of people knew that God was doing something, but who was this suffering servant? 
What did he do? What, who is he? What did he come? When is he going to come and deliver us? So it was kind of this vague, who is this uh, servant? But uh, Isaiah 53, 10. Has anybody got that? Yet yeah, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Though the Lord makes his life as an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Okay. So, if you want to fill in your things, I say it 53.10. How do we know God's going to do this? Because this Messiah, who was brutally murdered, is going to rise again. He's going to see his offspring. He can't see his offspring and do all those things if he's dead. So this Messiah, this anointed person, the suffering servant, rises from the dead. So it gives the people hope. You know, this Messiah is just not going to be a sacrificial death. He's going to die, but he's also going to rise again. So, again, in a dark time, you've got exile, now you've got God's anointed, and it's one of those things like, wait a minute, God, aren't you supposed to come in in victory? Aren't you supposed to come in in power? And yet, your servant is just, just died. Resurrection language, give us hope. Ezekiel 36. This one is the resurrection brings in the new covenant. Very familiar passage. Isaiah 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you from you your heart in stone and give you a heart of flesh. So we have a new creation, a new heart, a new spirit, a heart of flesh is a heart of life, heart of stone is dead. And so God is doing a spiritual renewal. The there has to be a spiritual renovation before a physical resur res resurrection. Here's a trick question, and it really doesn't, it would reflect how you view God. Do you see God in the Old Testament as one of wrath, judgment, lacking grace, and that God doesn't reveal himself as grace till the New Testament? question is, was there grace in the Old Testament? Absolutely it was. Okay, how? How many times not? Okay. <laughs> all, all throughout, he had, uh, he, was, he was there for um, Samson, he was there for how many times the Israelites went against him. He was there at the front of the line when they were leaving Egypt. He was there at the back of the line holding the, the Egyptians back. Uh, moving forward, you see him in Micah giving, giving grace to, to those that feel their trust in him. I mean, even after everything, he's always been and will be. Yep. So I think, and that's a misunderstanding. Sometimes we have to struggle with that because when we read the stories of the Old Testament, we think, God, you weren't very loving. You weren't very great, but you know, there's examples of grace. But he was always providing a way back. Always providing a way back. But if you want to see a story of grace from Isaiah, I, Ezekiel 36, and I found this absolutely fascinating. It really shows grace. Verse 22. And he's telling Ezekiel to prophesy because basically a lot of these prophets had a, a bad message, which was, look, Israel, you screwed up, you sinned, God's coming, either repent or something's going to happen. Look, you're a bunch of big babies, you worship idols, stop. You know, it was just constant, constant. Verse 22 in Ezekiel 36 says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord of God, I do not do this for your sake. Because they have been so bad, 
They had just done horrible things, but here's the grace part. But for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations. That's grace. God's saying, you don't deserve this, but because of my, I'm going to hold up my name, you're going to benefit from it. You're going to be delivered, but not because of anything you've done, but because of who I am, for my name's sake. And then Ezekiel 37, 3 through 5, someone read that really quickly, just a quick page over. Very famous passage. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. Okay. So here you have this valley of bones. And God tells him, prophesy to these bones. I think it's kind of funny. You have these bones and you just keep going, hey, what's going on? And to talk to these bones. You know, sometimes God calls the prophets to do some weird stuff. Like, okay, go talk to these bones and tell them to live. You sure got, yeah, go ahead and talk to them. They're going to live. But then these bones rise up and then you just got these bunch of these bones. But you have to also take into account chapter 36, where it talks about, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. Because it does no good for these bones to just walk around as bones if they don't have life. And then later on it says, prophesy breath of God. And they come in and they live. It's not just living and breathing, it's living with the breath of God. And they rise up and they become a great army, so God was telling them, not only are you going to be restored, but you're going to be restored politically. You're going to become an army. All right, let's wrap this up. Daniel, resurrection is the end of history, as we know, as we know. And Daniel 7, 13 and 14 talks about an eternal kingdom. When, when God finally ends it all, he's going to give the kingdoms of the earth to Jesus, the Son, and wars are going to stop, and the kingdom of the earth is going to be God's kingdom, it's going to be United Kingdom and all that. Daniel 12, 2 and 3, this has some really good stuff in it. Someone read Daniel 2 and 3, or 12, 2 and 3. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Okay, there's, there's three things going on here. One, you have a, a resurrection. You have a, and this is one of the most clearest passages in the Old Testament of what it means for resurrection. You have a resurrection. Some to life, some to death. So now you have a, a, a judgment, a finality of Okay, it's not just a resurrection, but there's going to be accountability. You know, what, what you do in this lifetime is going to determine what side of this judgment you face and rewards. And then, kind of cryptically, he talks about shining bright. Shining bright as a star. He's talking about glorification. He's hinting at something something else is happening. It's not just going, being resurrected, not only just beholding the face of God, not 
not only dwelling with God, but we're going to be glorified. And we're going to talk about that in five a couple of weeks. What it means to have a glorified body. How do we know what our glorified body is going to look like and do? Like Christ. Christ. When Christ rose from the dead and, and lived among the disciples for 40 or 50 days, whatever it was, he was showing them and showing us this is what an embodied immortality looks like. Okay. I'm, you're going to be able to eat, have fellowship, you're going to be able to do all kinds of different things. Um, kind of give us a hint. And I work in a, a school system for a few more months at least. Um, and we get breaks. And like Friday we got a, a, a snow day. Which I, I thought was, I liked it, but I thought it was kind of dumb. You know? <laughs> school systems have kind of gotten wimpy over the last few years. I like it, it's great, I'm not gonna complain. But we get like breaks, we get spring break. Every time I'm on a break, I go, this is what life should be. <laughs> and, and when I, I refer back to when I had COVID and I had to be off for a couple weeks, and then I was like, break time, spring break. So I had like three weeks, I, I couldn't do anything, I wasn't supposed to do anything. So it was great. Get up and go for a walk, and it's like, oh, I get used to this. I can really enjoy not working. So every time I get a little break, it kind of gives me a taste of what retirement would look like. That's the same thing with Jesus Christ. It kind of gives us a taste, just a, a sampling of what this is, gonna, what it's going to look like. Right. <clears throat> In verse 3, isn't there a, a third category? You have life and death. But the third ca category seems to be, says those that lead many to righteousness. Okay. Is a third category, shall shine as the brightness of the stars. Okay. And there seems to be some kind of difference between just those who uh, are saved. I'll use a, that vernacular and those that lead many to righteousness. Is there a separation there? I think so, a little bit. Well, that what you're applying to, I think, is in, in mission. That you know, God's people are on mission to not only get to here, but to bring as many people as we can, or to at least proclaim while we're here. So there's that idea. I think there's more. I think, I think that it talks about treasures in heaven and all these things, right? And so, or what it, you know, getting there and everything being burned up. I, I think there's more that along those lines of what, how you how you get in either by just cutting your teeth or by right, you know, the admonishment. And that's a good point. And I think sometimes we we talk about treasures in heaven. Our problem is we're still materialistic. Yeah. It, it gets us to where we live. So we're thinking, treasures in heaven, I'm going to get these jewels. I'm going to get stuff. I'm going to have a house. And which may, we may have it. But I think in heaven, that's not going to be the important thing. Part of heaven is going to be, oh, I got this stuff. Oh, the king is here. Oh, worship. We're going to just start worshiping. Oh, we're going to be showing off our stuff. Hey, I like my house. Oh, the king's in, king's in the street. We're going to just start worshiping. You know, it's just going to be this. We aren't going to have time to enjoy stuff because we're going to be enjoying his presence. Uh, real quickly, one of those uh, terms that, that preaches. Um, 1 Kings 16, 29 through 34. You have to look up, look up if you want to. But King Ahab becomes king. And when you look at the monarchy, there's two, two figures that stand out. David, so whatever a king did right, it was always, he did right according to his father David. Then there's another character, Jeroboam, if they did bad, which is most of them, it was, he did evil just like his father Jeroboam. So these two figures dominate the monarchy. Ahab comes along, 
he is the worst king ever. He, he marries a priestess of Baal, Jezebel. He begins to worship Baal. He sets up a temple in Samaria and Jerusalem to worship Baal. So he's trying to get Baal worship the central religion. And it talks about even the things that Jeroboam did was like just nothing compared to what Ahab does. So he is like the absolute worst king. Uh, Elisha comes along in verse 17, or chapter 17, verses 1 through 24. Elisha is a man of God. He's obedient. He invokes the living God. He says, I come to you, God who is alive. And he tells Ahab, you know, we need a fresh word from the Lord every day. That's where we come to church. That's where we read our Bible. Ahab got a fresh word from the Lord, but it wasn't a good word. It was basically saying, rain's not going to come until I say so. It's going to be a drought. So the question that God presents to Ahab, to Israel, and to us, who is in charge of the weather? Who is in charge of nature? Baal or God? Who is in charge of your life? The idols of worship or God? And so that's a question that's just is there when Elijah confronts um, Ahab. So it's Baal versus God, the living versus the dead. Then Elijah's obedient. God says, get out of there. Go by the brook. You're going to be taken care of by the brook. The crows are going to come and take you. Or take care of you. So God is telling Elijah, not only am I in charge of nature rain, I'm also in charge of nature that's going to take care of you. So it was kind of a illustration to Elijah that I'm in charge. I will take care of you. And then God tells him, go to this widow. He meets this widow, and she's basically getting ready to uh, make her last meal. God, you know, God provides, and eventually her son dies. And now Elijah is on the ropes. He's saying, God, what have you done? Have you brought me in to bring death to this person? The question we have to ask here is, is God in charge of life and death, or are we? Is God in charge of life and death, or our circumstances? And the answer is, God's in charge. We have hope. Next week, we talk about the New Testament. Right now, we talk about the Old Testament <laughs> and how the shadowy figure, dark times, this Messiah, who is, what's going on, how do we relate to it. Next week, everything changes. In the New Testament. Next week, we're going to talk about the resurrection, really what the resurrection means to us <laughs> and this hope that we have. Yeah. All right. Go. Bless, prosperous, and hope for spring. <laughs> <laughs> oh,